Good morning. If you'll turn your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 9, the end of Romans chapter 9. We'll read from there in a moment. <clears throat> in the classic movie, I'm not sure this uh, microphone's on, just a heads up in the back. In the classic movie, The Sandlot, uh, which is rated PG, uh, but I would still recommend filters for it, a group of young boys accidentally hit a baseball over their neighbor's fence. But it wasn't just any baseball. It was a baseball signed by none other than Babe Ruth. Well, when they had figured out what happened, they knew we've got to get that ball back. And the whole movie is about their exhausting efforts to retrieve that precious ball. They use a vacuum to try to suck up the ball. But you see, the problem is, the neighbor's yard is guarded by a dog nicknamed the Beast. <laughs> and the Beast destroys the vacuum. And then they build a catapult machine designed to scoop the ball up and shoot the ball over the fence. Well, the Beast mangles uh, that machine as well. And eventually one of the boys puts on a very special pair of shoes, uh, the PF Flyers, and he decides, I'm going to hop the fence and outrun the Beast. I'm going to run as fast as I can to get the ball, and he does. He grabs that ball, and he runs over the fence. He thinks he's safe. The beast jumps the fence, too, chases him all through the neighborhood. And eventually, in the process, the, the beast ends up getting hurt, and the boys have to help the beast. And the beast becomes their friend. Well, the problem is, now they've got to return the beast to the neighbor and explain everything that happened. So this exhausted, ashamed scared group of boys approached the door to old man Myrtle's house. And when they explain what happened and all that they had been through for that baseball, he asks, why didn't you just knock on the door? I'd have gotten it for you. In Romans chapters 9 through 11, Paul is addressing an objection by the Jews. The objection is God promised to save the Jews. And yet you're saying, Paul, that if Jews reject Christ, they will be eternally lost. If Jews are eternally lost, that means God has broken his promise to save the Jews. In Bible class, we'll talk in detail about chapter 9. But at the end of chapter 9, in the beginning of chapter 10, Paul explains that the reason the Jews are lost is not because God failed to keep his word, but because the Jews are going about attaining salvation all wrong. Chapter 9, verse 32, the first part, he says, Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. And if you drop down to chapter 10 now, in verse 3, he says, 10 and verse 3, For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They were seeking to establish their own kind of righteousness based on their ability to keep God's law instead of relying on the righteousness only God can provide through the gracious gift of his son. And what Paul wants them to know is that they don't have to be lost. And if they would just pursue righteousness the correct way in Christ, they can have salvation. The Jews are like those boys in the sandlot, exhausting themselves, beating their heads against the wall, trying to find some way to get that precious prize. And Paul's telling them, all you have to do is go knock on God's door in humility and ask him for it, and he'll give it to you. It's not that complicated. It is not impossible. It just takes faith in what God has provided for us on the cross. Jesus has made salvation attainable so that there shouldn't be any Jews or any other person, for that matter, who is not saved. Let's unpack the following verses this morning in Romans chapter 10, down through verse 13, because Paul's going to show them that God's salvation, truthfully, has always been attainable by faith, even under the law of Moses. And that was all made possible by Jesus. So let's start in verse 4. He says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The word end can also mean goal. The law of Moses has, was always pointing to the goal 
of righteousness by faith in Jesus. And think about how with me for a moment. There were two aspects, two main aspects of the law of Moses. Number one, the demands of the law. So you would have things like the Ten Commandments or laws about clean and unclean foods or laws about sexual immorality and, and hundreds more laws, demands of the law. The second aspect of the law of Moses was animal sacrifices by grace through faith. Animal sacrifices by grace through faith. When God told the Israelites not to eat or drink blood, he said in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. The blood of those sacrifices was a gracious gift from God to atone for their failure to meet the demands of the law. They didn't keep the Ten Commandments properly or the hundreds of other commandments properly. And even though they deserve death for their sin, God in His grace says, instead of you dying, an animal will die in your place. And this, by the way, would take great faith on the part of the Israelites to trust that when I offer this animal sacrifice, my sins have been forgiven. So even built into the law of Moses' system itself was the very fact and expectation that they would not be able to keep the demands of the law. And what they would need is to rely on God's grace through faith and the sacrifices of those animals. And here's the irony. Over time, the Jews lost sight of this two-part system. They seemed to forget that the animal sacrifices were an act of God's grace and eventually viewed that sacrificial part of the law as part of the demands of the law. And so they would boast and brag and say, oh, we keep the demands of the law because we keep all the sacrifices as well. And they boasted that they were the righteous ones and the Gentiles weren't because look at us, we're Jews. We're keeping the demands of the law by following God's commands, even keeping the animal sacrifices. You know, the Gentiles, they're wicked. They don't, they don't make animal sacrifices like we do. Think about the irony in that. <laughs> you see the irony in them bragging, boasting about their righteousness because they offer sacrifices and the Gentiles don't. The whole reason they have to offer sacrifices is because they're just as sinful as the Gentiles. True righteousness under the law of Moses is when a person meets all the demands of the law so that it would not even be necessary to make sacrifices for your sins. That's true righteousness under the law. You only have to make sacrifices because you failed to meet the demands of the law. So the entire law of Moses system itself points to our failure to be righteous under the demands of a law system and our need for God's grace through faith to forgive us. That is why the law of Moses ultimately points to the end goal of salvation by grace through faith in the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. Now, Paul's going to show them that God in his mercy has always made salvation attainable because he never expected them to perfectly keep the demands of the law. Verse 5. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. Paul is actually getting this from Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5, where Moses does say, in order to live, you need to keep the law. Do this in, in order to live. And if you uh, want the righteousness that's based on law keeping, yeah, you, you would have to do that. You would have to literally keep all of those laws. But God knew they wouldn't, which again is why he built in the sacrificial system and also why Moses tells the Israelites this in Deuteronomy 30. Keep a marker in Romans 10. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, please. Deuteronomy chapter 30. They're getting ready to cross over and invade the, the land of Canaan, take that, take that promised land and Deuteronomy is all about reminding the Israelites who they are. Remember who you are when you go into this land. This is your God. This is who you serve. Remember his law. And listen to what Moses says about this law. 
he has just laid out the blessings and cursings. Here's the blessings if you keep the law. Here's the curses if you don't. Listen to what he says now. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. 11 through 14. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. If God expected them to actually keep the law of Moses perfectly, salvation would be out of reach. But Moses said it's not. It's not out of reach. The law which gives them life is not too hard to keep. It's not up in heaven so that man has to go up in order, and get it in order to be right with God. It's not across the sea. And, of course, that, you know, for the Israelites, they were not seafaring people. Right? So it's not, you don't have to go across the sea somewhere uh, in order to get it. No, the word of God is near them for two reasons. Number one, because God delivered it to them. Think about the irony of them boasting that we are righteous because of our ability to keep the law when they wouldn't even have the law unless God in his grace gave it to them. They didn't have to go up to heaven to get it. They didn't have to cross the sea to get the law. God came down to Mount Sinai and gave them that law as a gift. That's why it's near them because God put it right in front of their faces. But secondly, it's near them in this sense, that God is not expecting perfect obedience. He's expecting them to put his law in their hearts, to internalize his law, to have it in their heart, have it in their mouth, to love the lawgiver, to meditate on his law, to teach it to their children. This is encapsulated very well in Deuteronomy 6. Look in Deuteronomy 6, please. <clears throat> God's expectations here <clears throat> are laid down very clearly in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house. And on your gates. Notice God doesn't say, well, you keep my commandments perfectly or you'll be lost. He says, live every day loving me, loving my word, having faith in me, teaching your children to do the same. That was God's expectation. And I use Deuteronomy 6 for this reason. Look over with me in Luke chapter 10 now. Luke chapter 10, when Jesus has a conversation with a lawyer. This is very fascinating. He has the conversation with a lawyer. This uh, kind of sets up his telling of the parable of the Good Samaritan. <clears throat> well, listen to Luke 10, verse 25. Verse 25, beginning, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? So think for a second, if you're a lawyer, Jesus says, what is, how does the law teach you to have eternal life? He could have said, oh, the law says we have to keep it perfectly and never break it. He doesn't say that. He quotes Deuteronomy 6. Verse 27, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And he tacks Leviticus 19 onto that in your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's the amazing part. Jesus, in verse 28, he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. When Jesus says, do this and you will live, he is quoting from Leviticus 18.5. Which means that when Moses said, in order to live, you must keep the demands of God's law. Jesus is saying the expectation of that verse, the expectation of God's law was never that you would keep them perfectly, but that you would love God and love your neighbor. It was never based on perfect obedience to the law. It was always based on a life of faith in God. It has always, therefore, been attainable because of what Christ has done for us. So let's go back to Romans 10 and watch what Paul does with this. Romans 10, verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith 
speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching. Is salvation by faith in Christ attainable? Absolutely. We didn't have to do the impossible. We didn't have to go up to heaven in order to attain salvation for ourselves. Jesus came down from heaven to give it to us. We didn't have to cross the sea. He actually mentions the word abyss there. Sometimes this, the depths of the sea and the abyss in the Psalms were equated with Sheol, the realm of the dead. So he uses that and says, we didn't have to go to the, to the grave, to the realm of the dead to get it. Jesus went to the grave. He went to the realm of the dead and God resurrected him so that he could give that word of salvation to us. Salvation is absolutely attainable because Jesus did all the work to deliver it to us. That's why it's near to us. Because God put his word right in our faces by sending preachers out to proclaim the good news of this gospel in Christ. This word that now we can be saved by grace through faith in Christ. He put it near us in terms of putting it right in front of us. And now he expects us to do the same thing with Christ that he always expected people to do with him. And that is to put the word of Christ, that, that beautiful gospel message in our hearts by believing and in our mouths by confessing. Look in verses 19 through 13. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I don't think that belief and confession in this passage are meant to be just a one-time thing before baptism in this context. It is describing a lifetime of faith where we trust Jesus for salvation and call on his name forever. It's not a life of perfect performance. It's about living every day with Jesus in our hearts and in our mouths. Yes, the Jews complained that it was unfair of God for them to be lost eternally. But Paul's saying, you don't have to be lost. God has done everything in his power to make salvation attainable to you. Jesus left heaven, went to the deepest depths of the earth by dying in order for us to have it. And praise be to God that salvation is not out of reach. And that we don't have to be lost. Because of Jesus... We don't have to be like the kids in the sandlot, exhausting ourselves by trying to attain salvation by our own performance and merit, only to be defeated by the beast of sin. All we have to do is humbly, by faith, go knock on God's door and ask for it, and he'll give it to us in Christ. So as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, let us honor Jesus for the sacrifice that makes that salvation attainable to all of us.